Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, thanks to, to the ACS and to CNE News, of course. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And some of what I'll tell you about today um, was covered in the introduction, but I'll sort of give you a flavor for uh, what inspired me to do what I do. Uh, I'll start, first of all, by saying I have a terrific group at UCLA. This is us standing in front of the observatory, which is actually on top of the math building, those little circles you see up there. And then the back behind that is Beverly Hills. And so it's a very nice view from our building. Um, I'll tell you where I come from. I started out uh, early life in Mexico. Um, in a small farm, actually, uh, just outside of central Mexico. And when I was very young, by methods that I can't remember, uh, I ended up in Los Angeles, and I grew up in this lovely city. Um, and from there, I went to UCLA, and what inspired me when I was young was not only a passion for mathematics, but also a passion for space. And so when I was really young, I actually wanted to be an astronaut. And I always thought about going up into space and colonizing Mars and, and doing all of that. That didn't quite work out, as, as you see um, from my current career, but I, I always hold out for the opportunity to go to space. So uh, if someone is looking out there, I can volunteer. <laughs> I, I started out working on this molecule called the transferrin receptor when I was an undergraduate, and this was one of my early research projects. Um, I started out trying to track uh, this molecule on the outside of the cell. This is a molecule that's responsible for bringing iron from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell so that it can make a lot of the great reactions that we heard about uh, earlier today. And I started out with two physicists, and their pictures are up here. Um, and they got me interested in, in looking at molecules uh, sort of from a, a cellular perspective, and we used to be able to track these over time. But when I was doing all of this work, um, I really was passionate about trying to put this knowledge to work, and so I decided to go do a PhD um, on uh, cancer research because this molecule that I was tracking was very important for bringing in an essential resource that cancer cells were using to proliferate. And so I started out making therapeutics, um, against this molecule, but sort of in my free time when I was sitting around not doing experiments in the lab, I would uh, think about not only the stars and astronomy, but also about how we look at things and how we look at the stars, how we look at um, small things and large things, and uh, maybe indirect ways of doing this. And so our conventional way of thinking about this is uh, to use a lens, and we heard about lenses earlier today, but you can do the same thing without using lenses, and instead by using mathematics to interpret the signals that are coming in, and therefore creating a picture. And that's exactly what I started doing in my spare time. Um, there's this method called coherent diffractive X-ray imaging, where you take uh, light, in this case it's an X-ray beam, and you shine it at an object, and then you recover the interference pattern that comes out of this interaction. And from that interference pattern, you can actually de reconstruct the structure of the thing that you were uh, illuminating. And I thought this was very powerful, um, and I was trying to use it at the time um, to look at the structures of cells. And so this is the type of pattern that you would normally uh, receive. And uh, of course, for those of you in the audience that are trained, you can immediately recover the image on the right-hand side of this, um, or I guess on the left-hand side from where your perspective is, uh, from this pattern. But uh, if you're not adept at this, you can use a computer algorithm to try to go from one to the other. And you can see that in this case, it, it very much matches the uh, electron micrograph of the same cell on the right. And so uh, while doing this, I was uh, in uh, one of these experiments. These experiments are conducted at synchrotron facilities around the world, and these experiments go on uh, 24 hours a day. And so in this particular experiment, it was a seven-day long experiment, and uh, normally you go in shifts, but in this particular case, uh, one of the persons who was supposed to do the night shift was out sick, and so in that case I covered for them, and so I was, I was doing the, the day shift and the night shift that day, and the very next morning when I was about to go to bed, uh, the person who was in charge of the local area came by and they were bringing in a, a visitor to sort of do a tour of the synchrotron, and they were doing a tour of our experiment. And uh, this visitor happened to be someone also at UCLA, and so they thought, oh, there's this team from UCLA doing an experiment. Why don't we introduce our, our famous visitor to our team from UCLA? They must know each other. It's UCLA. They all know each other, right? Um, <laughs> And so they, they bring this person in. This person was David Eisenberg. And he comes in, and I'd never met him before, and he, he tells us, you know, what are you doing in, in your experiment? And we explain to him, and he says, well, uh, I come here and I do experiments too, but we work not on cells, but on nanocrystals. And I thought, you know, that 
nanocrystals, what are you doing imaging nanocrystals? And that's because I, I'd been used to looking at things in this regime, but of course he was talking about much smaller molecules which are uh, sort of in this regime. And these are the crystals that he was uh, thinking of. These, of course, are microscale crystals, but if you look very, very, uh, at a very, very small region within one of these, you can see very nicely ordered molecules um, underneath. And so he started uh, to get me interested in nanocrystals. I, I kept in touch with David, and he said toward the end of my PhD, why don't you sort of switch careers and turn your hobby into a profession and come work in my lab? And I thought that was a terrific opportunity, and so I started working on nanocrystals, and I realized that there's a whole diversity of these nanocrystals out there. Anytime a molecule self-assembles, it forms uh, one of these structures. Sometimes they're more ordered or less ordered, um, and when they are more ordered, we can actually obtain information about the underlying structures by using crystallography. And so I was trying to get um, these nanocrystals to form, and I was interrogating them through a variety of techniques. These are three of the most common techniques now used to interrogate the structures of, the nan of these nanocrystals. On the, on the uh, sort of right-hand side uh, for you is uh, synchrotron X-ray radiation. These are the types of experiments that I was describing earlier. Uh, on the bottom is what I started using when I started in David's lab, and this was an X-ray free electron laser. It's a giant machine that's incredibly powerful. It's the most powerful X-ray generating source uh, on the planet, and there are a few of those now constructed. And then on, on the, uh, your uh, far right is electron diffraction, which I'll tell you about, um, and it's the basis for my group. Uh, so of course I told you about this uh, synchrotron-based work. This is a machine that's uh, about as big as a small hill. Um, actually, one of these machines has a, a mountain in the middle of it, and around the machine are a bunch of stations. Here you can see individual stations where experiments are performed. And to give you a size of uh, perspective here, these are the types of microcrystals we were working on at the time. Uh, this is a side, uh, an image of the side of a dime. This is the E of that dime. And these little pins that you see are actually glass capillaries that are holding the crystals. So on the very tips of those are the crystals that we were looking at. Um, but of course, the, the problem became more challenging where molecules didn't want to self-assemble into crystals that big. There are some cases where the crystals were actually only as big as a tiny, tiny fraction of this image, which is now uh, put into perspective uh, against the side of an SEM image of this dime. So it's even smaller than what I showed you before. And for those, we were using this large free electron laser, one of which uh, is built just outside of Stanford University. And so this is the highway here running um, almost perpendicular to this track, which is the laser itself. And the laser is producing x-rays that are going into these chambers that we were using, and in principle, uh, impinging upon a molecule or a small crystal and completely destroying it every time it hit the, the molecule or crystal, uh, but not before we were able to extract information about that interaction. And again, from that information, we were able to reconstruct the structure of the molecule. Um, but this was a sort of uh, slow process. There's only one of these available in the world when we were trying to do this. And so it was a little bit difficult to iterate between experiments. We needed something that gave us quicker feedback. And so what we did is we turned to a relatively new technique that was established at the time. And this was using an electron microscope instead of this giant X-ray laser uh, for several reasons. First, there are more of these available than there are X-ray lasers. Uh, there was actually one available on campus and our collaborators had one that they were um, using to look at nanocrystals. And so it's the same type of procedure, except instead of using a giant X-ray laser, now we're using this electron microscope to, to interrogate our samples. Um, and our samples looked a lot like this. So they were uh, crystalline species or solid materials grown in these droplets. And when you looked at them under the electron microscope, you can see these beautiful crystalline shapes with very nice uh, sharp edges, which uh, delineate nice crystals. Um, and our collaborators had solved the structure by this method uh, of lysozyme. It's a traditional protein used in crystallography uh, early in 2013, and then a more complicated structure in 2014, and that's where we came in. Um, and we were looking at amyloid proteins, which are responsible for a wide variety of diseases. Um, they range from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's to prion diseases, um, and we were interested in their structures, but their structures were difficult to characterize because unlike a traditional structure, these would become partially or completely unfolded and would then uh, form these uh, protein aggregates that would cause the disease. And if you zoomed into these, they look like rope-like filaments, right? And so uh, we were trying to characterize these rope-like filaments at the time. Um, and so again, we went from 
lysozyme to catalase to the structure that we were able to determine by this method. And it was a model of a protein that is responsible for causing Parkinson's disease. Um, and we were encouraged because uh, when later models came out, um, our structures seemed to match um, others that, that were found later on. And so we started trying to use this method to investigate other types of amyloid forming proteins and our methods for doing this evolved. And we started out by having to guess at what the structure of the molecule was in order to obtain a true atomic structure of it. Uh, later on, we used computational methods to actually uh, have computers determine the structures completely uh, ab initio. And so all we gave the computer was some data and then the, the computer was able to place every single atom of the structure into a particular map that matched the data. And we uh, were actually able to see a very nice uh, surprising effect of this. We had enough information in our data to actually place every single atom, including hydrogen atoms, which are very difficult to characterize by this um, technology. And so um, using that, we started looking at, at proteins, including the, the prion protein, which is responsible for things like mad cow disease, um, and trying to look at the high resolution structures of that. And um, we used the same types of techniques. We would get a very small protein crystal, we would shine an electron beam on it, and we would get these very beautiful patterns, except they would come from these tiny little crystals, where here you can see a scale bar of 500 nanometers, and that's larger than the width of this particular crystal. Um, and because the interaction is so strong between the electrons and these materials, we were able to get very fine resolution information equivalent to the best crystal uh, X-ray structures that had been determined to date. And so not only can we see individual atoms, here's a heat map where you can see clearly the shape of an oxygen atom, the shape of a carbon atom, the nitrogen, and little bumps for the hydrogen atoms. So we can place all of those very clearly. And we can see networks of interactions between these atoms inside of the structure that would tell us about why these structures are so stable, why they're forming these rope-like filaments, and in principle, um, why the structures might be responsible for causing disease. Uh, here we found a very nice network of hydrogen bonds because, of course, we were placing the hydrogen atoms in the right places, um, and this stabilized the structure. And so this got us thinking about uh, more profoundly, how do we push this technology into the future? How can we learn more about the structures of molecules than what we'd already learned before? And I um, convinced my graduate students and postdocs to take on this challenge, and they started uh, looking, for example, at structures in which we had a lot of diversity um, of information. So in this case, I'm, I'm showing you a typical micrograph of an assembly of crystals that might be formed and interrogated. And if we look at the one here in the middle and we take a diffraction pattern of that, you see the type of interference pattern that I'd shown you before with lots of these little spots uh, in rows uh, emanating uh, from the crystal and being impinged on the camera. This would typically give us a very high resolution structure. You need all of these individual spots to be able to synthesize the, the structure later on. And um, they came back to me and they said, well, these, these uh, assemblies don't always look like that. Sometimes they look uh, more like a broomstick or a combination of, of uh, shapes. And these don't diffract very well. They don't give you these very nice rows of spots. Instead, they give you um, these sort of streaky spots and just uh, very few of them. And we can't really make anything out of this data. We can't synthesize a structure out of this. And so for that, we thought about how material scientists look at problems like this on the nanoscale. And what they use is they um, are able to shape uh, electron beams into even finer, uh, more confined probes. Um, and are able to look at those interactions to extract information on an even smaller scale. And that's what we started doing. So instead of um, using a beam, here's a picture of a crystal sort of zoomed in. Instead of using an electron beam that's that big, which was already small for us, uh, we started using electron beams that are about that big, that tiny little red dot. And we would scan them across a sample, and we were able to take diffraction patterns now from uh, overall imperfect crystals. But on, on a local scale, um, they showed these nice uh, spots that we were used to seeing um, and trying to extract information from that. And so when you look at a, a crystal and you scan across uh, it using one of these beams, what you see is a sort of diversity of these patterns. And not all of the patterns are the same. And so what this tells us is that um, if the structure was a single structure across the entire crystal, nothing would change. If you scanned an electron beam across it, the pattern would remain the same. Uh, but of course, if there are uh, nanoscale changes within this crystal, then the patterns change. And so uh, when you add them all together, or if you were to illuminate it all at once, then the patterns would get all mixed up. Um, and you wouldn't get one cohesive pattern. 
And so we're able to cluster these patterns and extract uh, spatial information by uh, assigning them to specific regions of the crystal. And we would say, well, this region of the crystal shows this pattern, this region shows this pattern. Um, and in combination, we were able to create a sort of map of the local regions within the crystal and how they um, were relating to each other in terms of structure. And so what this shows you is a sort of orientation map of the uh, orientation of molecules within this crystal. And it corresponds to individual diffraction patterns um, within the overall structure. Uh, and, and that sort of has us very excited because it means that from a single crystal, you can actually obtain uh, potentially molecules in different orientations and different uh, poses and even look at crystals that aren't perfect or are undergoing reactions or are capturing particular states that are uh, rare or are intermediates. And this is facilitated by a whole group of collaborators. And uh, these are the members of my group that I showed you uh, early on. And we're funded by uh, very many different uh, foundations and um, we're sponsored by national labs and we're, we're allowed to use their instruments, which is uh, a great opportunity. And uh, I wanna thank you for uh, listening to my talk today.